So tonight, we're proud to welcome Iceland's Bragi Olsson and our own Karen Finneycrock. And what is a writing jam, you ask? Well, we're going to find out together. Mm -hmm. Here's how it works. A few months ago, we asked Bragi and Karen to provide brief character sketches. Then they exchanged them, and each set about writing a story in which both of their characters appear. And those are the stories we'll hear tonight. So the character that Bragi provided, Hans Marr, 47 years old, a divorced father of two, an ex-soccer player, quite well off after years of professional soccer in England, but he has put on considerable weight in the last years and he suffers from high blood pressure. And the character that Karen provided, a female college student who is studying crows and has just started hearing voices. <laughs> so after we hear Karen and Bragi's takes on these characters, you're invited to construct your own zine of these stories themselves with Zap, which is set up in the back corner over there. So stick around after the reading and make your own stuff to take home. Let's get started. Karen Finney Rock is the author of the poetry collection Ceremony for the Choking Ghost, which Bus, Bus, Bus Magazine raved. Finney Rock's work strikes the perfect tonal balance of humor, devastation, and real storytelling, never just using metaphor for metaphor's sake. Karen was also one of the editors of Courage, Daring Poems for Gutsy Girls, about which the stranger said, Courage feels like the cool older woman who sits her little sister down, stares her straight in the eye, and gives her the kind of blunt, funny, rude advice that will forever alter the course of her life. Karen is also the author of two beautiful books for young adults, The Sweet Revenge of Celia Dore, and most recently, Starboard Murphy and the World Outside. Of the latter, Booklist wrote, the language manages to be simultaneously quiet and passionate, and the numerous characters all shine through with full backstories, creating a unique and fully immersive reading experience. But the real reason we asked Karen to participate in tonight's writing jam is that we are all thrilled every time we see her on stage. Her in seeing is top notch, her performance poetry will slay you, her long prose will haunt you, and you're about to witness her mastering a whole new form, the short story. Please warmly welcome Karen Penny Proff. so much for coming. Um, I'm so honored to be here. I am thrilled. I've been thrilled since uh, Ryan first told me about his idea for the City of Literature and Seattle um, hopefully being recognized as the UNESCO City of Literature. And so what an honor to get to read at this inaugural event. I think this is the first event, isn't it, that City of Literature is having? Um, I'm also so thrilled to be reading with Bragi. I've been excited about it um, ever since the idea came to me, or really perhaps ever since I was in high school wearing all black, um, you know, uh, uh, pulling my bangs in front of my face and listening to the sugar cubes and feeling a little bit cooler than all of the other kids around me. Um, so uh, tonight I am, I am jumping into something I have not really done before, which is short story. Um, and this event has changed my life in one other significant way, which is I've been thinking a lot about Iceland. And I'm finally jumping into, for the first time ever, writing some fantasy. And I'm writing this story about uh, these sea witches. And it occurred to me that, of course, the sea witches are Icelandic, obviously. So um, now it's, it's kind of infused my work in other ways. Um, the story I'm going to read for you tonight the title is, Before We Go Quiet. Before we go quiet. I'm like you. I love my mother. I pick chocolate cake on my birthday. I would take all the abandoned animals and love them to stuffing if I had a house big enough to keep them. I don't like the news. I don't like to see plant beds that aren't watered enough, or wide green lawns that aren't near a river. I see ghosts, too. Everything is haunted in some way. The metal chairs that line the gravel walkway, the military helicopters that can function as planes, the jean shorts and fringe tops of the tourists, all full of ghosts, seated or flying or worn as a second skin, ghosts everywhere with us, not that I need to tell you. Earlier today, I sat under a shade tree on a hill. The tree was full of ghosts. Ghosts love cool, dark places, which explains basements and wells. 
dungeons explain themselves. Excuse me, said a ghost when he stepped on my foot. It's funny about ghosts, the way you have to keep them in their place or else they will run roughshod over your kitchen, turning out flower bags onto the linoleum, squeezing all the dish liquid into your sink. So I was surprised when this ghost apologized, and at first all I said was, huh? First day, he said, standing awkwardly and too close to the tree, the way a kid hides in his mother's skirt. I had a doctor's appointment scheduled for today at two, he said. Other ghosts in the tree shot nasty looks at us. The new one was talking too much, and they wanted to watch the military boat roll confidently through the sound or the mountain snow melt without listening to him yammer. They were veteran ghosts, already quiet, <clears throat> bobbing along on time like buoys in a wake, barely moving like sheets drying on a line. What about you, said the ghost? Why are you at the sculpture park on a Tuesday? Shouldn't you be at work? I should be in class, I said, but I got kicked out. I don't want to talk about it. A crow companion cawed ironically in the tree. In a few hours, it would fly 20 miles north to roost in the wetlands. I'm Mary, I said. Do you know your name? Yes, said the ghost. My name is, it's, he moved closer to the tree, deeper out of the sunlight. Maybe the first letter, I said. M, he said. No, H. Of course, you and I know that by nightfall, he wouldn't know what a name is, or a country, or eating, or dreams. The old ghosts around us couldn't even start the alphabet or count to 10. Yesterday, I was smelling things, he said. I felt chilly, and I wanted to have a drink. My ankle hurt. He looked down at his inexact body. I'm worried about my kids, he said. Can you find them? They need to know I love them. Unlike us, most people don't know about the ghosts that hang from the living shoulders like rain ponchos, or drape their legs from window sills, or collect in the corners with dust. They foolishly imagine that ghosts haunt houses, or imbue their spirits into amulets, or roam the halls of museums moving medieval armor around. You and I know that ghosts can pop up anywhere blown over the ocean like styrofoam peanuts, or balloons released from playgrounds with tagged strings. H's children could be anywhere in the world. I would never find them. I tried to help a ghost once, and that's why I got kicked out of school. Did you tell them you loved them when you were alive, I asked. Of course, he said, every night, every time I kissed them, even on the phone when they were with my ex-wife, I bet I said it 3,000 times. Before they could even talk, I whispered it over their bald heads. Could they have misunderstood, I said? Did they think you were joking or being sarcastic? <clears throat> what? No, said the ghost with disgust. Then they know, I said. Who knows, he answered, because already he was showing signs of going quiet. He gazed out past the branches of the tree over the deep and glistening Puget Sound. What was the best part of living for you, I asked, to bring him back? I admit it, I was lonely. I was killing time away from my parents since I got kicked out of school for trying to save my lab partner's life. There was a feeling I had with other men, said the ghost, like we were dogs in a pack. We ran in the sunlight over a field so green it clashed with the actual grass. The epitome of life is health. We were so beautiful. I think we were heroes or something. Maybe we were knights. He obviously wasn't a knight. He was probably a stock trader or a jockey. I've got to get back, he said suddenly. I've been gone too long. They'll be worried. Ghost panic. It strikes the new ones out of the blue. He pushed away from the tree and took two steps down the hill before recoiling from the sunlight and stumbling. The crow in the tree started an alarm call, an unsyncopated series without repeats. 
Ghost panic always alarms crows. You and I know that, but including it on my research paper got me kicked out of school. <laughs> a second crow flew in and joined the call. The other shade ghosts started stirring, their milky bodies mixing into froth. They began that low, throaty grumble they use to warn us that they're getting angry. Anything can happen when ghosts get angry. Disrupted cell phone calls, food spoiling in its wrapper, children tripping on the walk. What are they? H screamed, looking wildly around the tree. They're just crows, I yelled, causing a few of the living to look up from their phones. Come back into the shade. H crawled up the hill to the tree. He looked the way headlights do, sweeping over a lawn when a car backs out of a drive. Crows have more than 20 calls, I said, trying to distract him, but their major types are companion calls and alarm calls. These two will travel north at dusk to roost at my school in Bothell. I was their best researcher before I got kicked out. They glitter like coal in the sunlight, H said. So black they belong to space. I never even looked at birds. I played sports and watched the stock market and worried. I ate steaks and drank Patron and cursed. That was always the saddest part. I hate it when ghosts lose their families, when their loves and heartaches drift away like rafts on a sea. But I feel worse when they recognize the world they missed, when they realize what they lost to distraction, compulsive behavior, repetitive thought. Before they go quiet, they realize they will never jump in a cold lake again and hate feeling so cold. I could take you to see them roost, I said. You've got enough time. What's time, said the ghost. Like you, I've done difficult things. I walked through the city at night screaming for my grandmother after she disappeared from the house. I held my cat's shoulders when the vet gave the injection. I made it through my sophomore year. But like you, I wasn't prepared to escort a new ghost on public transit. I did it on a whim, which is one of my character flaws, or strengths, depending how you look at it. Once I picked up a wandering dog in a parking lot and drove it up and down every street in Wedgwood to see if it recognized any of the houses. It curled up and went to sleep in the passenger seat, so I bought it a hamburger and let it out in the park. Of course, I ended up missing another class, which is ultimately why I got kicked out. The trouble with taking a ghost on a bus is one glimpse of a dark alley and he might slip through the window. Too many talking humans and he might break the glass or blow out the radio signals. Young ghosts are volatile and finicky. Lucky for us, the bus stop was shady, and the window seats were all taken. My new ghost hovered beside me as I clung to a strap, distracting him with talk about crows. Facts about crows. One, crows use tools. They crack nuts with the tires of cars, obey the walk signal to get into the street, dig in the dirt with broken spoons. Two, crows remember faces. On campus, we started wearing masks so they wouldn't harass us. I wore Marilyn Monroe. My lab partner, Jason, wore a wig and glasses. Jason said I looked better as a brunette. Three, crows have funerals. At the body of a dead crow, a group will gather and observe, look for the cause of death, caw and flap and scream. It's called a cacophonous aggregation. I shouldn't have mentioned funerals. H started to shudder like a strobe light. I kept muttering crow facts to him, but people were watching. I tried to pretend I was reciting facts for a test, looked at my notebook like I was memorizing a lecture, but that didn't stop the nosy woman in the elderly seat from gawking. What, I yelled at her, what, what, what? Which is exactly the type of behavior that got me kicked out of school. <laughs> the trip to Bothell took an hour. H was beginning to fade. He stared for so long at a girl's yellow shoelaces that I thought he was done for, gone quiet even before dark. But he snapped to attention to ask me if the bus was taking us to heaven, which made me so sad I had to bury my face in my notebook. Yes, I told H. 
The next stop is heaven. We're almost there. We arrived at my campus 20 minutes before dusk, giving us enough time to walk from the bus stop to the wetlands. A few early arrivals, four or five, flew over, importantly, vanguard birds on surveillance duty. H wavered beside me in the waning sun. He would love the closeness of the wetlands as much as the crows, but we had to make it down the shadeless walk first, and he was already starting to quiver. Looking at him was like looking at an old television, the picture growing wavy and thin, jumping from side to side. A few more crows flew overhead. Some land landed on the crown of the library, waiting to fall in with the larger flocks. It reminded me of standing on the sidewalk in Portland, hearing the drums coming and knowing the rose parade was drawing close. The sun sank below the tree line, and H grew a little stronger. He was becoming a true ghost each minute closer to night. I continued along the path, past the parking deck, toward the tennis courts. That's when I heard the voice. It wasn't a crow. Mary? What are you doing here? It was Professor Kepner with his pompous gray ponytail. <laughs> King Kepner with his courtiers, the science students. My lab partner, Jason, was with him. Mary, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'll have to call campus security if you don't leave immediately, Professor Intimidation said. Professor Overreactor stated. <laughs> Professor Ruin Your Life If You Make One Mistake rattled on. I'm just here to show my friend the crows, I said. Then we'll leave. It's his last chance to see them. Professor Secrecy glanced at Jason. Mary, do your parents know you're here? Let's walk back to my office. He stepped toward me, and I stepped back. The crows will be here in five minutes, I said. He can't see them from your office. Who can't see them, Mary, said Professor Blind. I put a lock of hair in my mouth and chewed. Jason, why don't you take the class over to the soccer field and observe the birds on the astroturf, said Professor Concealment. I knew what he wanted from me. He wanted me to pretend that H was just some dust catching the evening light, that ghosts were not crowding into the wetlands like passengers boarding a ship. I know you've had to do this too. Meet with a teacher and pretend a ghost wasn't dangling from her earring. Talk to the police officer as if ghosts weren't toying with his badge. Stand before the judge while a ghost rose up behind her dripping teeth and claws. But I couldn't do it anymore. Since the day they burst through the doors of the lecture hall, flooded down the stairs and demanded the podium, so many new ghosts, the product of the world's conflicts bombarding into my animal behaviors class, who wouldn't screech with, with fright? Who wouldn't run to the dais and pull the lapel mic from a dean? You remember it. I was trying to save my fellow students to throw myself between them and the raging dead. Who wouldn't have kicked a chair, overturned a table? And who could blame me if I missed? Call it friendly fire or collateral damage, injuries sustained in the line of war. Not all ghosts are docile. There are some who wish us harm. These living with their see-nothing eyes don't know that. So I was trying to explain it again to Professor Ponytail when the big flock came over, darting every direction in the sky. They came in, largely silent, swooping down to the fence posts and branches. The two from the sculpture park were there. I could tell by their missing feathers. They filled the sky like a bowl full of black fruit, some flapping and some gliding by. I heard H next to me sigh and mutter, they're black as volcanic rock, so black they're white. They're flying to the next world just over the stone wall. They're leading me into winter like a hundred angels. H started slipping away then, like a chalky puddle, dribbling toward the soccer field, the wetlands, and the other ghosts. I wanted to beg him to wait for me, to ask him to take me along. But that's why I got kicked out of school, and it wasn't my time to pass on. 
We all belong with the ones who can relate to us. Even the dead need to be understood. Even the crows fly miles to roost with other crows. That's why I'm so thankful to have you to listen and to understand me. I thought about you the whole time Professor No One walked me off the campus toward the bus stop in the dark. How I would call you and your voice would sound like syrup on pancakes. If I didn't have you, who would see me? Who would be enraptured by these miserable details? Who would find my small story enthralling? Who would miss me when I go?